armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Let's pray. Father God, would you open our eyes to see the spiritual reality of this world? Uh, don't let us take spiritual warfare as something light or something purely physical, but help us with eyes that are seeing and with ears that are hearing to see what the spiritual realm is all about and see how even there Jesus Christ's cross is planted firmly for our victory. And as we understand this and implement this into our lives, Father, open our eyes and help us see what our true reality is as we go through the mundane and everyday details of our lives. And may there be victory in every person here lives in their families and in their workplaces and their schools, may there be victory both spiritually and also physically. And we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's be seated. Paul uh, wrote this letter to the Ephesians, and uh, this, he wrote this while he was in prison. And so it's called a prison epistle. It's one of the prison epistles. Uh, chapters 1 and 3, I'm going to summarize it very quickly for you. It talks about and summarizes the joy of the truth that makes someone a Christian. What makes you a Christian? Uh, it is God's election and predestination. And we have a whole series that we're going to talk about that. Okay? And then adoption as the sons of God and daughters of God. And then salvation by grace through faith, which is huge, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And then also uh, unity in the Holy Spirit. Unity in the Holy Spirit. That makes us the church. Then in chapters 4 through 6, Paul tells Christians how to mature in their faith. If you have been saved by faith, then apply it to your lives by starting with what? The families and marriages. <coughs> families and uh, couples, if you need scripture to tell you how to live, uh, read Ephesians chapter 4 through 6. It's very, very helpful. Now, with all that said, uh, let's summarize everything we have so far. Now, we have a powerful church that knows how to mature in their faith by applying it to their families and marriages. And they're comprised of unified and mature families. And we have a powerful force here, a very, very powerful force, which is called the church, the church of Jesus. Now, what do we do with this? I believe EPC is getting to the stage right now, amen? We're getting to the stage of understanding where our salvation comes from, also where we're going towards, and we're knowing how to apply it to our everyday lives. But now, so, much, so what? So now what? What do we do with this? Paul tells us, get ready for war. Okay. Can you repeat that? Get ready, get ready. For, war. for war. Let's see what this means. He says in verse 10, finally, so finally he summarizes everything from chapters 1 through 6. upon your experience, don't rely upon your knowledge, or your economic prosperity, rely upon the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And then why does he say that though? Why? Verse 10 tells us, the armor of God, right? And then finally, we ask why one more time more time. Why put on the full armor of God? Why put this on? Okay. There is a reason that we have to be strong in God and not of ourselves, and Paul tells us this reason through a very popular uh, literary device called a chiasm. chiasm. Uh, this is what a chiasm is, and we only get this from uh, seminary, so <laughs> it's very, uh, very nerdy, but at the same time, very, very powerful if you understand what Paul is trying to do through this. Okay. So chiasm, uh, the Greek uh, letter for uh, chi, it looks like an X. It looks like an X. And so it's a reflection of the previous structure, A, B, C, C, D, A. A, B, C, C, D, A. It's a A, B, C, C, D, A pattern. And we call it a sandwich. And so uh, verse eight, 
A1 and A2, verses 10 and 13, they're like the outer bread of the sandwich. And it tells you, be strong, be strong. Be strong is the conclusion that we're trying to reach. But then if you go to the center, it says, put on the armor of God. And then verse 13 also says, therefore, put on the middle part, right, between the bread. And what is that? Well, some of you might like the bread more. But it's not hard to eat. Uh, the meat, the good stuff, is in the middle. And here is the good stuff. Because we don't fight against flesh and blood, therefore, put on the armor of God, therefore be strong. Do you get that? The conclusion Paul's trying to say is, you know, be strong and putting on the armor of God is going to happen, but you need to know why. Because our flesh and blood is not at war. We're not fighting against what we usually think we fight against. We're fighting against something else. And that's what we're trying to uncover today. What are we fighting against? What are we really fighting against? You know the answer, but you don't know the implications of that answer. And so we'll dig into it. So, indeed, the end of verse 11 says, so that you can stand against what? What are we really trying to fight against? The schemes of the devil, the devil's schemes. We're fighting against all the traps of Satan. And... I don't know why you're not afraid right now. Because he is a supernatural, personal, powerful, evil source. And we have no way, of, no way, no way of fighting against him in our natural means. And so, are you not scared? Because you've seen what he can do to your family. You've seen what he can do to a whole society. Right? Now at this point, you know, just imagine. So, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, Paul says this. And we have to think for a second, you know, imagine how awkward this would be if you were actually in a war, okay? So we formed a church. Uh, suddenly, all the diaspora around the Mediterranean, they gather, and they hear people praying and, and glorifying God in their native tongue. And so they're like, something crazy happened to us. And so uh, even though they were just visiting Jerusalem, suddenly they ended up deciding to stay there, to live there. And they formed something called the church, something that never happened before. And these are former tax collectors, former Gentiles, uh, former prostitutes, everything that the Jewish society looked down on is now comprised by the church. It's a powerful, radical new community, saved by faith, by grace, right? And with this huge community, now they're asking, what do we have to do? And they're like, let's go fight. Let's, you know, let's do something for the kingdom of God. And they're ready to go up that hill and charge down and face the enemy. And because they've seen how powerful Jesus is, how powerful his resurrection is, they think the enemy is going to be you know, just you know, standing with club and shield. Club and shield. But then you get to the top, and you suddenly understand that you misunderstood the nature of this warfare. It's like you expected them to have clubs, but they have um, assault rifles. And that's the case. And so Paul is telling us that how awkward the situation is. Don't go up there, because hold on for a second. The hill is there. And before you start warfare, let me tell you something. Be there. struggle is not against flesh and blood. The war that we're trying to fight is not a physical one. And that's the first point that we want to talk about today. It's not a physical war. It's not. Well, let me ask you. Wh why are so many of us dressed in the wrong clothing? Dressed in the wrong armor? You know the, uh, the full list of all the uh, armor that Paul talks about right after this? Let me give you a parody of that. What we actually have on. So why do some of us have on the breastplate of self-help, self-help and positivity, and not the breastplate of righteousness? Why do some of us have the belt of common sense and not truth? A belt was uh, supposed to keep a man's pants on when he was swinging a sword, and so uh, he could focus on the warfare and not look, he could look at his uh, pants for example, right? And so why do we hold our pants up with common sense and not the truth of the Word of God? the wrong war. It's the wrong war. The shield of your 401k. That's what you're trusting in. You're trusting that your pension is going to one day save you and not the shield of what? Faith. Faith. Wrong war. The sword, not of the 
the spirit, and not the sword of the word, which is sharper than a double-edged sword. We have the sword of what? Science, information, and technology. That's your weapon right now. That's your weapon. Wrong one. Or wrong armor. Depending on which war it is. You have the helmet of humanism, and not salvation. You are so well grounded on common sense that salvation is not your foundation, it's common sense is. And you don't know how deeply it is ingrained into your very thought processes every day. Every day. Finally, you have sandals. And sandals are meant for you to carry to something, right? You have sandals that are eager to spread what? What's your highest ideal? Democratic processes, right? Uh, the power of the free market. That's what you believe in. And it's not gospel. It's not the gospel that you're carrying with these sandals. And so, why are you dressed like this? The issue is, what Paul is saying is, you're expecting the wrong warfare. You're geared up to fight the wrong enemy. Brothers and sisters, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Amen? We are not fighting against flesh and blood. Otherwise, your armor would have worked. It would have worked. However, verse 12 elaborates, but we fight against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And he is laying it down, bam, 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 bam. This is how scary and formidable our enemy is. And are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Now, what do you know by this list? Rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and the spiritual forces of evil. When you read this, uh, two things come to mind. It is a twofold battle. It's a twofold battle. Not only is it not just physical, there's a spiritual aspect. But not only is it just spiritual, there is a physical aspect. The word here, rulers, the word rulers is archos, archos. It always refers to a human leader, a human leader. And so rulers are actually working with Satan to fight against you. And I'll kind of show them examples of this here. And also authorities, the word is exousias. Exousias, it means authority which is either physical or mental power. Physical and mental power works against you. Physical power. So, this points to the physical realm, physical manifestations and symptoms of a deeper spiritual evil. And here's an example. This is a letter that you will have to sign if you are teaching in China as a, as a teacher. And I'll just translate a quick portion of this. revitalization of the people's future in China, the revitalization of the education system, and the resolution of worldview, view of life, and value system can be further advanced. And therefore, to that purpose, my commitment items are as follows. Number one, I will be persistent in following co correct political direction, in advocating science, in promoting atheism, and in opposing theism and feudal superstition. Second, I will remain firm in rejecting any religion. I will not participate in any religious activities. I will not promote or spread religion in any place. Three, I will firmly establish Marxism beliefs. I will promote education and learning of atheism and unbelief of religion. Unbelief of religion. I will be a law-abiding model for others, and I will not attend any heretic organizations such as follow me. Follow me, right? I will aggressively promote the new civilization and new trend of socialism. I will not be part of a propaganda for feudal superstition. I will not teach any religious information to any students. And then I will accept penalty if I violate any of the above commitment items. And you have to sign this. And it's dated by the Communist Party of Branch. And you cannot teach if you don't sign this. This is Arkos, a leader, a human leader, imposing spiritual darkness. It is. But on the other hand, we have the terms dark world and spiritual forces of evil. And these are obviously, even just uh, on face value, these are pointing to a deeper spiritual reality, the essence of what we're trying to look for. And so there is a spiritual reality, and then there is a physical manifestation of everything that we're fighting against. And that is summarized as not fighting against flesh and blood, but spiritual warfare. So spiritual warfare is what? Both spiritual and also physical. Get this? Okay. Both spiritual and physical. Everything 
is involved. So, the important thing is that we understand both levels of spiritual warfare, but the question is which side do we tend to rule out? Which side do we most naturally lean towards? Uh, if this was Africa, where most people usually think everything in terms of power and spirit, uh, these are the two biggest terms in African religiosity. If that was the case, this sermon would be a whole lot different. I would be talking about uh, the importance of the mind, the Christian mind, and then the importance of sound doctrine and good teaching. But, we're in San Jose, and we ignore the spiritual realm all the time, all the time. And therefore, we have to focus on the spiritual realm. I mean, how many of you think that the issue of AIDS in Africa can be solved just by sex education? By just passing out more condoms? Anyone? How many of you think that democracy and science can solve the conflicts in the Middle East? Democracy and science. Human weapons. They haven't worked so far, right? How many of you think that psychology and a better understanding of dysfunctional families will solve the problem of addiction in America? To any addiction to anything. Doesn't work. Hasn't worked so far. Sometimes works. Because there is a physical realm. But I mean, does anyone see a spiritual issue in any of this? A spiritual issue. A deeper spiritual realm. The scripture shows both sides. Scripture has no deficit in, in terms of this. It knows how to deal with the problem of evil. The natural and the physical co coordination and the reinforcing the spiritual reality of evil embodied in Satan. The, the Bible talks about evil this way. And that is where we are waging war against. Now, this is an implication of the sermon. When you put on spiritual armor to prepare for spiritual warfare, uh, you will look stupid to the people who are trained in conventional warfare. Do you get that? If you put on spiritual armor because you see the spiritual world, you will look stupid to people who put on conventional armor. Let me give you examples. David uh, was fighting, his, in, uh, fighting for Saul uh, against the Philistine army, ex um, especially Goliath, right? And so as he was going out there, uh, what did Saul give him? His own armor, right? And so David puts on Saul's armor. It's too big, it's too clunky, he can't swing the sword, it's too heavy. And so he says, you know what? This doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm fighting against this guy. I need to be nimble. I need to be uh, adept. And so he takes it all off, and he chooses what? Five stones and a sling stone. And a lot of people comment. Uh, there's a commentary about this. I really like this interpretation. Uh, David didn't need five stones to kill Goliath because um, if you read the rest of the book of Kings, Goliath had five brothers, and so he was going to kill all of them <laughs> with five stones. And so that was the gut that he had, uh, the audacity that he had in spiritual warfare. And so he takes off the clothing, and everyone's like, wow, this, this kid's going out to die. And so who are the two people that are concerned for him? First of all, Saul, he's like, you're going to die out there if you don't wear conventional armor. And then who's also concerned for him? Goliath. He's like, like you came out here with, uh, with like a stick and, uh, you know, uh, some people say that if you're very tall, uh, you often have, uh, uh, there's a medical condition where you can't see too well. And so he saw the sling as a stick. And so he saw, thought David was coming out to just shepherd him or something, right? And so he's like, you know, like you came out here without the conventional weapons of warfare, and I'm, I kill people. You, you look stupid. You look clumsy. And that is the response of the world when you engage in a spiritual world. Because we look naked to the world. <coughs> naked in terms of conventional warfare. Another example, 2 Kings 6, 5 through 18. stupid, the servants probably. They're like, what are we going to do? Conventional warfare is right at, in front of us. What are we going to do? And my prayer for you is when you're saying and when you're looking at the spiritual issues of your life and you only see the physical and you're crying out, what do we do? What do we do? My prayer is this. Oh Lord, open their eyes and let
let them see. May they see the spiritual reality that is surrounding us right now. Oh Lord, may they see scales fall off their eyes so that they see. Do you see the Lord? Do you see your circumstances? Do you see through God's eyes how He sees your circumstances? Toronto is very, very anti-Christian right now. Uh, the decisions of the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario, I, I follow them on a monthly basis, uh, they are... Uh, disproportionately advocating for the rights of any other religion, any other worldview, other than Christianity, uh, to the detriment of Christianity. Even. Churches there are closing left and right. Uh, there are depressed and broken families and congregants all over Toronto right now. And they are experiencing a spiritual famine. Left and right, churches are closing. Let me ask you, what would you do? Let's say you're a pastor. You're sent over to Toronto, and you're going to start a church plant. What are you going to do? Some people would take a political approach. Let's say, let's reform the government so that they would be more rational in their decisions. Maybe, right? Some of us would take a legal approach. Let's educate and send good Christian lawyers into the government and influence how cases are decided in every level. Sounds cool, right? And some people would say, you know, let's start a family outreach program. We'll find mental and family health counselors and spread them across all, all of our communities so that they have access. But this is what my friends ended up doing in Toronto. Uh, these are my friends from YWAM, and all of them are um, very, very good at uh, playing instruments and singing. And so uh, let's look at the Facebook page. It's a, it's a private video. I couldn't download it, and so I'm just going to show it off my Facebook page. Uh, full screen, please. Light. <laughs> Different from the warfare that we are accustomed to. 
There's four things that make you a difference. Desire against you. Satan fooled Eve by kindling her desire for independence. For independence. Now, I was listening to a, a sermon by Tim Keller, and he was uh, talking about uh, what this looks like. Let me give you an example. And so, he was talking about how uh, a piano, if you lift up the lid of a piano, uh, if you want to find out what tone of your voice you're using, if you want to figure out what tone you're using, all you have to do is you sink into a piano and you find that the, the, uh, the string uh, that coincides with your frequency resonates. Okay? And so I'm going to try, when I tried this yesterday, it actually worked. I don't know if it's going to work today. <laughs> yeah, people pat walk by and they're like, what? <laughs> so, say, uh, CPC? CPC? CPC. <laughs> Not too scared today. <laughs> but the theory is, if you had an instrument uh, that gauges it, it works. And let me tell you something. Uh, this is exactly what Satan does to you. Uh, there are strings in your heart, and all that Satan does is he pulls on those strings, and you resonate. Do you know why spiritual warfare is so hard? Because you think it's your desire that you want. It's actually Satan resonating your strings. He's like, go out there and have fun. You know, slander that person. I know you already knew. It's your desires that you think are fooling you. Satan uses this. And so this is different from traditional warfare. He uses your own desire against you. Your own desire. You resonate. And so you think you're being fooled. Let me read you a passage from James. That tells you this. James says, 1, 14 through 15, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. His own desire. The then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And that is our destiny if we don't fight the spiritual warfare. Your desires will lead to your own doom. And Satan knows what they are. Number two, this warfare is different. This battleground is different because it uses your own mind against you. Because what? Satan's a liar. Satan's a liar. John 8, 44, you are of your father the devil, and he, Jesus continues talking, and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for Satan is the father of lies. Father of lies. And so when the father of lies wages warfare, what's his biggest weapon? Lies. And so your mind is always fooled. You always tell yourself, you know, um, maybe, maybe this time. Maybe this time, you know, I don't need accountability from the community. Maybe this time. And your mind is always fooling because Satan has planted a lie within you. A lie within you. This is different from conventional warfare. You can't see your enemy. Number three. This warfare is different because it uses your guilt against you. Your guilt against you. And because Satan is an accuser. The name Shatan. Shatan in the book of Job. It means accuser. Someone accuses. That is his job description. Okay? And so he always goes to God and he says, Look, your son that you, you, that you sent your son to die for, your, your daughters, your children down there in the earth, they are doing this, they're doing this. Uh, they think you're not watching, but every night in front of the computer they do this. And every night, uh, every day, they have arguments and they always fight and the church looks like it's in shambles. And he's always telling this to God in God's presence. You know what? In the book of Job, Satan always has access to God's throne. Do you know that? And he always walks there and he accuses people before them. And so, therefore, how are you going to fight that? Are you going to go up to heaven also and, and argue against him like a lawyer? No. That's why Jesus is what? The intercessor who whispers into the Father's ear saying, Ah, that's canceled. I got, I got rid of that. Okay. I took care of that. Hey, Satan, he's accusing your children right now, but remember me, my holiness is on them. And so he's interceding for us. And if you don't have that, this spiritual warfare, you can never win. You can't use conventional weapons for this. Finally, this warfare is different because it uses your allies against you. Diabolos means slander, right? To throw something... <laughs> not going to throw that? <laughs> to throw something between people, right? Diabolos. And Satan slanders. And so he always causes people, especially when they're about to be on fire for God, Especially when they've been saved again. Especially when they're about to be sanctified. 
Another level of obedience. That's why Satan always uses a friend to tackle you from behind. And you're like, what just happened? And all of a sudden, you lose all your spiritual focus, and you're just focused on consumed with fighting against that friend or your spouse or that other family. Isn't same timing, same timing so obvious? It's so obvious. Whenever you're about to be on fire for God, whenever you're about to obey, that's when he attacks and uses your allies against you, your closest family members. And it's too obvious for you to keep on stumbling over the same thing over and over. It's too obvious. And yet you can't see this because your eyes are closed to the spiritual realm. You know, um, when people fight in front of me, what do I do? I don't tell them, hey, you're right about this, and you're right about this. And so let's meet on middle ground, and let's say both of you are wrong, and let's forgive each other. That's conventional warfare. Stupid. How do you actually make them one? How do you actually make them one? You say, hey, stop looking at each other. Start to turn, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder. See Satan between you guys? Don't you see him planting a seed within you? And that is stroking your desires to even hate your brother more? Why don't you fight against him? You're wasting your energy trying to argue against each other. If only you saw you saw how obvious the strategy is. This warfare is different. And conventional armor will not work. So please stop relying upon it. You must grow. Amen? You must grow. You can't stay in the same place if you were for 15 years. You must grow. Now, if we see how different this battlefield is, therefore our warfare requires a different armor. Verse 12. Put on the armor, the full armor of God. And here's the list. And see how customized this list to withstand Satan's attacks. If Satan uses your desires against you, you need the new heart promised by the new covenant. Amen? So that your desires will be pure. So that he can't use it against you. Satan uses your mind against you. Therefore, you need what? The truth. The belt of truth that is external to your mind. So that your mind will no longer be a filter. But truth works for you. That's what you need. If Satan uses your guilt against you, you need what? Righteousness. A breastplate of righteousness to protect you. If Satan is accusing you, you need righteousness. And if Satan uses your allies against you, what do you need? The last verse of Eden 6.10. The gospel of peace. The sandals of the gospel of peace. That makes peace between your brother and sister. So, God's armor is contextualized to help you win against Satan. Do you see how obvious this is now? This list is so point on point for Satan's attack. And so, the armor of God is custom made to withstand this kind of warfare. It has been time tested over and over. It is righteousness, truth, faith, word, prayer, salvation, and gospel. Now, here's the last thing I want you to do. Don't turn this into a list. Don't turn this into a list saying, I need to get this, I need to get this, I need to get this. This is all coming from somewhere. But let me tell you where this comes from. Have you ever wondered where this armor comes from? It sounds like such a random assortment of equipment. But if you read the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, you find out that this is, you know, this should blow your mind. I hope it does. This is actually God's armor. God's own armor that he wears to warfare. Okay? I don't know if I wrote it down yet. He put on righteousness at this breastplate, and this is he with a capital H, is God, the Messiah, the Messiah, put on righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. And so this is God's armor that he wears to engage with Satan and injustice and the world. So what are we saying here? What are we saying? What is the conclusion of all? This is a messianic prophecy about what God wears for warfare. In other words, by referring back to Isaiah 59, Paul is telling us to wear the battle-worn, time-proven, and blood-dripping armor of Jesus. All of his power, all of Jesus' resources are at your disposal. Do you know that? Jesus gives you everything he has to fight this warfare. Now, what a power this is. What a power this is. How powerful is this armor? It is a power that overcame the physical pain of suffering on the cross and death, the physical part of it. 
and the mental shame and anguish of being betrayed by his closest friends, the spiritual despair of being separated from God, this armor will sit all of it. And therefore, when Jesus resurrected, he overcame the physical, the emotional, and the mental, and the spiritual complexities of spiritual warfare. Do you see that? And so basically what Paul is telling us, put on Christ. Put on Jesus. He won this war for you. All you have to do is put him on. Then you're ready for warfare. Your armor is Jesus. It's not the, it's not the pieces of armor that he's talking about. He's saying, this all describes who Jesus is. Put him on. Put him on. And he invites us to share his victory today. I don't know if you know how desperate your spiritual warfare is. But does this not warm you up? Kindle your excitement. That you can actually succeed in spiritual victory. In spiritual warfare. You can be victorious. Amen? I mean, does this, is this even attractive to you right now? That you can defeat Satan? Is this attractive? Like, you can actually be holy. Do you know that? Is this attractive to you? Then this should have you jumping up and down for joy. I can actually overcome Satan and actually be sanctified and actually live the life that God wants me to live. Don't you want this? Or is are you still worried about the next paycheck? Where's your mind right now? Here's the last part. Many of you are probably wondering, okay, I want this, I want this, I want this new armor. I want to stop being pincushioned by Satan. He's attacked my family for too long. He has no place there anymore. And I don't want to see my husband or my wife be devoured by Satan every day. And so, you want this armor. But the question is, how do you put this on? How do you put on this armor? Anyone want to give me a suggestion? How do you put on God's armor? Anyone? How many of you have recently put on this armor? And how many of you have recently experienced victory? How did you put it on? Anyone? I guess it's better for a small group setting, these kind of questions. So I guess uh, in your small groups, you'll talk about how you actually won this warfare. Uh, so in your small groups, okay. So I'll save the rhetorical questions. But here it is. Uh, what does it mean to put on the armor of God? Put it on. Uh, here's what it says. The term put on comes from the verb and duo, and duo. Um, and if you separate this, it basically is and and then duno. And duno. And means into, into. And then duno basically means to think into. Think into. So you're basically thinking into, into. That's a literal uh, paraphrasing of this. What does this mean? So when you're putting on the clothes of God, you are thinking into the clothes of God. You're thinking into it. You're being saturated by it. You're becoming one with it. And so, um, you know, if you go to, you know, Comic Con, you have people dressing up, and you don't when you ask them, you know, who are you? Uh, they don't say, oh, I'm just, um, you know, make-believing to be this character or that character. They don't say that. They say, I am that character. That's who I am. That's what I am here for. I am here to show what this character is all about. I remember when I saw my dad uh, when I was 11 years old. He had a concert um, in front of a lot of people in the University of Texas. And he, he wore a, a, a tuxedo and a bow tie. And he sung so beautifully. I was like, man, this guy's good. Like, I heard him practice at home. And I didn't like it, but actually, in front of the audience, like, he's really, really good. And so uh, I was actually, you know, like, pretty, you know, um, in dazzled with my dad that night. And so he fell asleep. And I go into his wardrobe, and what I did, you know, was a small kid, 11 years old, puts on the tuxedo, it's like drooping all the way down here. And I put on the bow tie, and I look into the mirror. Oh, what am I doing here? Does that make me my dad? But what am I doing here? I am adoring him so much that I am make-believing to be him. That's what a duel is. To become. To hope to become. To strive to become like. When your daughters, uh, when they grow up, there's always that one stage when they put on your makeup. What are they trying to do? They're not trying to look prettier. They're trying to become like you. Become like you. Paul says, and do owe Christ. Become like Christ. That's what it means. And so, practically speaking, how do you do all this? If I was in a monologue, this is what in duo would sound like. Jesus, I'm reading through the Gospels. 
and I see how you made decisions. I see how beautiful your judgments were. I see how awesome your mercy was. I see how you un loved the unlovable. You forgave the proud, and you lifted up the humble. You, you, you healed the broken and the sick. And so how amazing, I, I am in dazzled with you. I want to be like you. And so how do I think more like you? How do I struggle like you? How do I engage in warfare like you? And it's all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You keep your eyes on Jesus all the time. And th there's a funny story in Korea. A, a, a monk, a Buddhist monk, he sat meditating in front of a, a rock, a huge rock for 40 years. 40 years in front of a rock, okay? And everyone said this, and there's records about this. When he got up, after 40 years, everyone said his face looked like a rock. His complexion, his, the way that he stared, like very expressionless, he looked like a rock. And it's a spiritual principle. You become like what you look at all the time. And so how do you endure old Christ? How do you put him on? You look at him all the time. Look at him, look at him, look at him. Your minds are always away from him. You're not looking into the gospel to see how he made decisions, how he looked at the world. You know, every time his disciples asked him something, or the Pharisees asked him something, Jesus would give, it, give a stupid answer. It never seemed to add, answer the question that was being asked, and that was his spiritual way of warfare. That's his way of living this world. And if you don't see that, if you don't keep on witnessing that, then you are not putting on Jesus, not aspiring to be like him, not being saturated with Jesus. How do you win this warfare? How do you stand strong? How do you put on the armor of God? Look to Jesus. Keep on looking. The eyes of your heart, your mind, your emotion, your spirit, your soul, all focus upon the person of Jesus and keep track of him. See how he lives his life. And then, before you know it, you're deflecting the enemy's darts before you even know it. It's like, you know, Neo after he uh, in the second movie, right? You are just doing it. You're fighting for spiritual warfare, and you're winning. And you're winning because you can't help it. Because you're looking at Jesus all the time. And may that be the case with you. So enamored with Jesus. You put him on all the time. You've been cross-playing him so, time, so many times. You, you've been imitating him so many times. That warfare is natural. And you see what Jesus saw. You breathe what he breathed in. Amen? I have homework for you, PPC. This week, and do all Jesus. Okay? Repeat after me, and do all Jesus. Put on the armor of God. What does this mean? Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Fall in love with him. When you open, when you close your physical eyes in prayer, open your spiritual eyes to look upon him. Meditate on his life, his work, his death, and his resurrection just for you. Share and savor his victory. Savor his victory. He overcame everything that you need to fight against. The enemy's guns are filled with rubber pellets. They hurt, but they cannot destroy you. Because Jesus won. He already won. And so if you put him on, nothing in this world will overcome you. You will quench the flaming darts of Satan. That's what it promises, right? Share his love for one soul. How do you do warfare? You love the person next to you also. Just like Jesus, hate evil and sin. There was a time in high school, I was addicted to pornography. I actually took my belt and Neil overcame me. <laughs> and I whipped my computer until it broke. Crazy from the world standpoint. But God was so honored that. Hate evil and hate sin and have mercy upon the sinner. Just like Jesus. If you see Jesus long enough, you will know how to do warfare like this. It's so easy, so easy. His life shows it all. Right? Participate in his death and self-giving humility every day. 
For it is not I who live, I have been crucified with Christ, and now Christ who lives in me, and duos in me. I put on him, and he puts on me. I don't know who I am anymore. And you stop focusing on yourself now. You're freed from focusing on how shortcoming you are. You're freed from the slavery of having to focus on yourself all the time. How pure am I? How, how humble am I? And you go around church asking in comparison to these people around me, how holy am I? You get to be, be free from that when you're just obsessed with Jesus. Don't you want that? And do, oh, Jesus, put him on, CC. CCP, put him on. That warfare is done. You don't have to know everything we talk about. Just put him on. Put Jesus on. And as yours will be the victory. For why? For thine is the victory. Right? Now, we got the center layer of the sandwich. We got the next layer. And now the final layer. Now you're ready to stand strong in the Lord as his church. Powerfully saved. Being sanctified. Becoming more mature. And now knowing where to attack. Knowing where to direct your focus on. You're ready <laughs> If you have Christ upon you, and over you, and in you, and covering you, and under you. Let's pray. Let's take this time to ask God to open our eyes. You don't see the chariots of fire around you, because your eyes only see the hurt and the depravity and the bitterness and the anger that surrounds your life. Open your eyes. See the victory that Jesus has accomplished for you and partake in that victory. Will you not? Let's take this time to ask God, can you open my eyes? Help me see what the devil's schemes are. Help me see what your intent for my family is. Help me see what the spiritual battlefield looks like so that I may invest my resources into the right place and stop living for the wrong reasons. Let's pray that God would open our eyes to see what He sees. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would open our eyes. Open up their eyes, Father. May they see. Open up their eyes, Father. May they see. Father, all they see is the world. But Father, you want to show them what you see want to show them how beautiful your kingdom is and how terrible is the coming judgment to come and you want to show them how beautiful redeemed people of Christ are and you want to show them how gross and sick sin is and evil is and the desires of our hearts how you want to separate that from us Father. Father help them see help them see, help them see Father help them see Father help them see their family was spiritualized Help them see their children with spiritual eyes. Help them see their parents and their friends and their small groups and their church with spiritual eyes. Open their eyes to see what's happening in this church right now. Open their eyes, Father. Father, when they see the reality of the spiritual warfare around them, now help us drop all of our conventional gear, ready for conventional warfare. And when we look at what's in our hands, we know that it's useless against this fight. Help us put down our hope in money. Put down our hope in education, that somehow a PhD will make me a better person. That somehow being richer will make me happier. Help us put down our weapons and our armor of conventional warfare. And that's what we call repentance. Repentance. Help us repent. Let's take this time to silently repent before God. With your spiritual eyes, I want you to look at your two hands right now. What's in them? What are you clenching so hard onto? What hopes do you have in your hands that you think will gain you victory over anything? And if they are not weapons for spiritual warfare, if they are not the word of God, if they are not the prayer of the saints, would you drop them, please? Would you please drop them? Let them go. 
Let them go. Let's take this time to repent. the minds of your eyes, the eyes of your heart, take this time to mentally, physically, spiritually put on Jesus right now. Put on Jesus right now. Favor him more. Love him more deeply. Cherish his words. If you don't know enough about Jesus to put him on, go into scripture. Talk with your community, talk with your pastor, and find out more about this person, this crazy, crazy person that carried the cross for you so that you would have victory forever. And do, oh Jesus, at this time, I want you to engage in some awesome creativity, spiritual creativity, and put on Christ however you can. You've shed your old skin, you've shed your old clothing and your old armor, and now you are putting on Christ as a beloved child puts on his father's clothing, so too are you doing as well right now. So let's put it on and feel his love for you, his power for you, his holiness that he fought and purchased for you. And put it on. And do oh, saturate yourself with him. And then let your words come out of your mouth right now in loving prayer towards the Jesus who would have part of you and would reside within you and to be saturated in you. Let your words flow out of prayer right now. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, we love you. We give you the attention of my heart, the desire of my heart. I give unto you. I love you. You are what I want. May my heart be fixated upon you, Father. Be the love of my life. Be the apple of my eye. Because I am yours, Father. Jesus, we love you as a church. Your children here love you, Jesus. You accomplish victory for us. So that we would no longer rely upon ourselves, but upon your strength, your wisdom, Jesus. Your Messiah, Jesus. Shelter, Jesus, 